You see the title, you see the thumbnail. We are going to be ranking the top 100 players in the NBA. Now, I do need to set a couple disclaimers before we actually get started with the list. For one, I am not putting any rookies on this list whatsoever. I just don't think it makes sense to rank them. They're literally in the middle of the summer league right now and half of them aren't even playing anymore. I know ESPN likes to do that, but me personally, I just think it's very weird to rank players who haven't even played with their real team yet. So I'm not going to be putting guys like Wemby on this list. Also, just know we're ranking a hundred players. So if you don't agree with my list, that is completely fine. It was very hard to find the top 100 players to put on this list but nevertheless i was able to do this with the help of a couple friends kind of giving me some tweaks here and there also another key thing is that i'm not going to be going into crazy detail per player some situations i will explain more than others like in the top 10 i'm probably going to go into great detail but like for number 100 i'm not going to have to spend five minutes talking about why this player is number 100 now everything aside get your popcorn get your snacks get your raisin canes because that's the best fast food place on earth and let's start off this list with number 100 draymond green draymond green gets underrated a lot I feel like however there is so much talent in today's NBA and I just don't think Draymond matches any of that talent anymore of course he's still a good defensive player but a lot of the things that he was once good at and that he had important impact on he no longer does maybe Draymond Green will prove me wrong this season but I just don't think that Draymond is no longer that guy anymore and honestly it was kind of hard to even put him at 100 it was a very close call at number 99 I got Josh Hart Josh Hart is one of my favorite rotation players and I genuinely do believe that he has gotten better over these past couple years and he is a very important player on the Knicks. I think him now getting a full season with the New York Knicks is going to help him a lot. And overall, if the Knicks do well in the playoffs, I think Josh Hart is going to be one of the main reasons. At number 98, I got Mike Conley. There's not a whole lot of things I can really say about Mike Conley at this point, at least to justify him anything above 98. To be honest, it's not really his fault. He's getting up there in age, but he's just no longer the dominant point guard that he used to be. Nowadays, I see him more as a veteran point guard, someone to just help out the young guys, if that makes sense. At number 97, I got Dylan Brooks. This this might be a little low for some people, but let me say this. I think Dylan Brooks can be a great rotation player, but the problem is he did a lot of dumb shit last year that it overshadowed his talent. When Brooks is at his best, he is a great 3 and D player that can help you contend as a team, but the problem is he wasn't that last year. Last year, he was more of a WWE character compared to being a great player. If Brooks can just stop with the antics and focus on basketball, then he will easily jump on this list. And now in Houston, I think he's in a different environment, so we'll be able to see. Is he going to play that bullshit? I honestly don't think so. At number 96, I got Franz Wagner. There's not a whole lot I want to say. He's still developing as a player. He's coming into his third season. I think he'll make a big jump this year, but it's kind of hard to justify. I will say though, if he's on pace for what I think he's going to do this year, then maybe he'll be in like the 80s or 70s. But again, there's so much talent, so it's hard for me to rank him any higher than what he is. At number 95, I got Josh Giddy. I love Josh Giddy as a playmaker, and really that's the only reason why he's on this list. He's good at other things, but it's really his playmaking that made me even want to put him on here in the first place. I think a trend you're going to see from like number 100 to like 80-ish is you're going to see there's a lot of young guys. And one, the reason why they're so low, even though they could be higher, is just because again, there's a lot of talent, not to mention, I just want to see more. Giddy also does play a certain role on the Thunder, so that is something to take into consideration. At number 94, I got Caleb Martin. I think about Caleb Martin's playoff run that he had with Miami, and I also do think that he's still a solid rotation player. And I am interested to see if that playoff run just kind of opened Miami's eyes and they're going to start giving him more opportunities to score in the regular season. Hopefully they do. At number 93, I got Steven Adams. I love Steven Adams in the interior. I think he's good for Memphis. I think he was one of the reasons why Memphis struggled last year because he was injured. However, one of his biggest flaws is just his offense. I don't think there's really much you can use him for on the offensive side. So that's why he's like at 93 compared to maybe 80 to 70-ish. Okay, now 70 is crazy, but I think 80 wouldn't be too bad if he had a little bit of an offensive bag, but he doesn't really need one for the role that he plays. At number 92, and this is going to be pretty controversial, I got DeAndre Ayton. Now, before people try to come at me in the comment section, let me just say that I am a Phoenix Suns fan, a diehard one at that. And let me tell you, there are so many big men I would take over him. Not only is DeAndre Ayton pathetic, he's someone that does not try, he is weak and gets bodied constantly. While I do think he has somewhat of an offensive bag, I like his post-hook game, I like his mid-range game, that's a 
as far as it goes. You could maybe blame it on just, I guess, his part in the offense. Like he's not the number one scorer. He's like probably four or five. But even when he got the opportunity, he never really took it. And overall, I think Deion Jayden is just overall pathetic. If you want to know the honest truth, he barely made this list. But thinking about his upside and thinking about the potential that he has, I do think he still deserves to make it. And if he has a good season, he'll definitely jump. But it's very hard for me to put him above a lot of centers because those centers actually tried. Deion Jayden, he does not. And speaking of that, at number 91, I got Kevon Looney. Does DA have a better offensive bag than Kevon Looney? Yes. However, DeAndre Ayton is not even close when it comes to Kevon Looney on the defensive side. Kevon Looney is a player that I would love to have on my basketball team and is going to help you win a championship, i.e. 2022. I do think some people underrate him as a big man, but trust me when I say he's definitely top 100, and in my case, he's number 91. At number 90, and this might come as a shocker, I got Herb Jones. I think the upside of Herb Jones is insane, and I think he's going to help out New Orleans so much. I do think there's some development that he needs to do on his side, but overall, I think as time goes on, Herb Jones is going to get better. Again, I need you guys to remember that a lot of these young players that are either rotation pieces or maybe young starters are going to be kind of low on this list. It's so hard to go off a small sample size, especially with so many players being talked about. Hence why I didn't even want to entertain the idea of putting Wemby above guys that have already made the All-Star game. Even same with Scoot Henderson. Now at number 89, I got Devin Fussell. I think Vassell is going to be one of the most important players on the Spurs roster, especially with Wemby coming in. I do think that he's going to be the leading scorer of this team, either him or somebody else that's going to be on this list. But yeah, man, I love the potential of Devin Fussell, and he's someone I'm going to be paying attention to. At number 88, I got Derek White. Not a whole lot of things I can say. He's a great player for the Celtics. He's someone that was very important in their playoff run. But overall, I really don't think anyone's going to try to debate with me that he should be higher than 88. But uh, yeah, shout out Derek White for having one of the most ugliest pictures I've ever seen on NBA Twitter. At number 87, I got Alfred Shangun. Shangun is a player that I am absolutely in love with. Pause. I think Shangun is going to be great for the Rockets moving forward. And I do remember a time where people were saying Shangun was going to be the best player on this team. Mind you, there were so many young players that they had drafted, but Shangun was the one that most people saw with a lot of potential. I think this year is going to be very eye opening for the Rockets, and we're going to see how well Shangun can do. I do think his development might get a little bit messed up because of who the Rockets brought in. And similar to a guy like Devin Fussell, he is a guy I'm going to be paying attention to with a pretty close eye. At number 86, we got my boy Cam Johnson. Cam Johnson made a pretty big jump last year and it was very apparent, hence why Brooklyn really wanted to get him back. I am so glad that Phoenix finally decided to start him over Jay Crowder, which yes, that caused a bunch of shit, but it was totally justified for Cam to start. And that's also why Brooklyn brought him in, they kept him as a starter, and he kept playing well. I think Cam Johnson is going to be very important to the Brooklyn Nets' success as a team. And Cam, man, I miss you. I hope you come back to Phoenix in the future. But yeah, that bag he got was totally justified. At number 85, I got Tobias Harris. There's not a whole lot of things I want to say about Tobias Harris. I just think he's a solid starter for the Sixers, but yeah, you do not deserve the money you're making. I need to know who his agent is and have him do my brand deals because how in the fuck are you making 30 mil plus a year? Hey, but get your bag, King. I respect it. At number 84, and this might be controversial as well, I have Austin Reeves. Now, I was actually in a Discord call with Two For One, who is a pretty good friend of mine, and we were talking about this list and something he talked about was Austin Reeves saying I put him too low and I do think some people are going to agree with him however I want to say this one we've only seen one season of Austin Reeves actually be a solid player but number two now we have expectations for him we didn't have expectations to start last year but now that the Lakers know what he's capable of they're going to expect more from him but if AR-15 has the poise I think he does then I think he's going to jump on this list next year but we just got to wait and see at number three I have Christian Wood and this might shock some people because I think Wood has potential to be better, but he just didn't get utilized properly. Like why he wasn't starting was so confusing to me. And I'm seriously glad that he's going to be leaving this team pretty soon. At number 82, we got Keldon Johnson. Not much I really want to say about him, but I do think he has a lot of upside on the Spurs team. And I think Pop has been handing his development pretty well. When there's another player on the Spurs roster that I say could possibly be the leading scorer other than Devin Vassell, I was referring to Keldon Johnson, by the way, but I think you guys picked up on that. At number 81, I got Nikola Vucevic. Vuce is a good player, don't get me wrong, but I don't think he was worth the contract that he got. Not to mention, if you look at the stats, Vooch is literally a net negative for this team. He has his moments, but I'm sorry, I'm just not that fond of him. And I think a lot of Bulls fans could agree with me. At number 80, I got Jordan Clarkson. I think Jordan Clarkson has been a solid player for the Utah Jazz, and I am interested to see how they can utilize him as they start to become more of a better team. I know a lot of people liked when Jordan Clarkson was coming off the bench, but I feel like ever since he became a starter for the Jazz, I feel like his production and overall his role in the team has gotten a lot better.
Carter. At number 79, I got Malik Monk. I think Malik Monk was one of the most important players in the Sacramento Kings little playoff run that they had. Monk was a pretty good shooter last year, and he's also someone that played that bench role pretty well. If the Kings want to be a better team this year, I think Malik Monk is going to need a little bit bigger of a role, and I think overall they should try to involve him in the offense a lot more. At number 78, I got Trey Murphy. Trey Murphy is one of those guys that I think has a lot of potential to grow as a player. Comparing his sophomore year to his rookie year, he made a huge jump and overall became a way better player. He was a guy that could average you 15 points per game on great shooting splits. Not to mention, he's a great defender and someone that can do a bunch of things that really don't show up on the stat sheet. And if New Orleans can get healthy, I think Trey Murphy is going to be very important, a part of some very successful playoff runs that the Pelicans could have. And I'm just going to be honest, Trey Murphy is one of my favorite players in the NBA when it comes to rotation guys. At number 77, I got Clint Capella. Clint Capella is one of those solid double-double guys that can get you like 12 and 12 or 15 and 13. I will say statistically, his production has gone down slightly ever since joining Atlanta, but that really just could be a coincidence, especially because he's getting older. Wait, he's only 28? What the f- At the time recording this video, there are some trade rumors that he's going to be leaving Atlanta due to a trade, and the most popular team I'm seeing is the Dallas Mavericks. I'm not going to really try to speculate on if he were to join Dallas, but I will say I think it could be fun. At number 76, and this might surprise some people, I got Russell Westbrook. I think Westbrook for the past couple years has been someone who has had a terrible, and I mean a terrible image in the NBA. He was once an MVP player, someone that was one of the best guards in the NBA. However, as time has gone on, he's became by far a worse player. But to be honest, I don't know if it's necessarily his fault. In LA, and I'm talking about the Lakers, I feel like he just kind of got put in the wrong position. Of course, he did a bunch of stupid things, but ever since getting traded to the Clippers and the playoff run he had, I think Westbrook has finally found his way. The Clippers took a chance on him and everybody climbed the Clippers, but honestly, it was one of the smartest things they could have done. Westbrook just re-signed with the Clippers this offseason and I'm interested to see how he gets utilized with this team. I don't think he's ever going to be that MVP version of himself again, but I do believe he's going to be a productive player for the Clippers to possibly have a great playoff run. At number 75, I got Malcolm Brogdon. Fresh off winning the 6th Man of the Year award, Malcolm Brogdon was one of the reasons why the Celtics had a successful playoff run. Now, of course, he had his bad moments, but ultimately, I think Brogdon is still a great point guard to have on your team, especially if you're looking for someone to play that backup point guard position. Hint, hint, Matt Ishbia, get it done. Similar to Clint Capella and other players on this list, there are some rumors that he could get traded, but it doesn't specifically say where, so I'm just going to assume he's going to be on the final roster come the start of the season. At number 74, and once again, this might be a surprise, I have Jalen Green. I think Jalen Green has the potential to be a great player. I do believe he's going to be the franchise player of the Houston Rockets, but something about last year just wasn't that appealing to me. I believe Jalen Green was playing this like AAU basketball style when he was playing on the Rockets, but to be fair, they were just trying to tank. They weren't going to be a good team, so maybe that's why they did it. But overall, I think Jalen Green has a lot of flaws in his game, and I think he has some positives, but honestly, the flaws kind of outweigh the positives. I don't know if Jalen Green's even going to be the best player from his class, but if he is going to, then he has a lot more work to put in. I mean, a lot of people were saying that he wasn't even the best player on this team. They were saying that it was Shingun. Overall, I like the potential of Jalen Green, but I need to see more before I put him higher on this list because there are a lot of other young guards on this list that are higher than him. And speaking of that, at number 73, I have Anthony Simons, or some of you might know him as Alvini Linguini. Not all jokes aside, we just had him on the starting five pod. If you guys want to check it out, link in the description. But seriously, Anthony Simons is a great young player and someone that I have been a very big fan of. I feel like when Damian Lillard leaves the Trailblazers, which is looking like more of a reality as every day passes on, but when Dame leaves the Blazers, I feel like Anthony Simons is going to fill the point guard role extremely well. This is someone that has been developing in Portland for the past couple of years, and we've seen flashes of him being good, but I think him and Scoot Henderson are going to be a great duo. I will say, as time has gone on, Simons has only developed more and more, and I think Portland trading Dame would not be the worst thing in the world, and the only reason why is because they have Simons. And if you are one of these seven Portland Trailblazers fans that actually exist, then I don't think you should be worrying that much. At number 72, I have Buddy Hill. There's not really a whole lot I can say other than he is a great shooter and also the fact that he is an asset that Indiana is probably waiting to trade because, well, he's just not going to do much on Indiana, I feel like. Number 71, I have the worst NBA Players Association president of all time, CJ McCollum. Seriously, what the fuck were you thinking? But all jokes aside, CJ McCollum is one of the reasons why the Pelicans even had a fighting chance last year to make the playoffs after Zion went down for the millionth time. It does suck though because CJ is starting to get older and I just don't think he's as good of a player as he used 
used to be. I do think that CJ will be a very important player when the Pelicans inevitably make the playoffs because I know they're going to. And the X factor of that team is either going to be him or Trey Murphy. It just depends how you look at it. At number 70, I got Miles Turner. Miles Turner is a solid center, but Indiana is currently looking to trade him. And I'm not going to lie, as a Suns fan, I wouldn't mind flipping him for DA. Turner is a solid shooting center for his team and someone that could be a pretty great scorer. However, I just don't think Indiana really needs that. I feel like if he was a lot better on the defensive side and could get a little more rebounds per game, then he'd be a lot more looked at as a player. But regardless of that, I do think Miles Turner is going to be looked at more as a trade asset than a starting center for the Pacers, which is kind of tragic because I think he's been pretty solid for them. At number 69, nice. I got Tyler Hero. I will say that Tyler Hero has been a pretty solid player for the Heat, and I do think he could take the next step in his career and be possibly an all-star level player. But with him getting injured in the playoffs, we really never got to see him in playoff form. I don't know if Miami would have beat Denver even if they had Tyler Hero because the Denver Nuggets were so damn good. But regardless, I don't think it would have hurt them. I feel like if Hero was able to play, maybe the series would have been a lot closer. Hero is involved in a lot of trade conversations right now, and there's a possibility that he does go to Portland. In my opinion, I just don't think it makes any sense for either side whatsoever. I mean, Portland already has Simons and Scoot Henderson, so I guess Hero's going to be coming off the bench, which, I mean, okay. But even for Miami's case, I still think you could use him. Now, unless a third team gets involved and he gets traded to, I don't know, the fucking Nets, then I think he should just stay on Miami. Either that or this man is going to be a lock for a sixth man of the year. At number 68, give me Jarrett Allen. However, if this was a list regarding drip in the NBA, then Jarrett Allen would be number one because have you seen this man's fits? All troll shit aside, Jarrett Allen is a 14 and 10 and 10 guy. Wait. Oh, never mind. That other 10 is for his three point percentage. God damn. The Cavs are a team that I believe are on the rise, and I think Jared Allen is a very important part of that team. I feel like he is a great interior presence, and he's going to level up as a player this season, in my personal opinion. As time has gone on, Jared Allen has only become a better shot blocker and a lot more reliable on the inside. I mean, let's not forget, this man was literally an all star one year ago. He's an all star caliber player just waiting to go off. Now, for number 67, it was between Jared Allen and Nick Claxton. It was a very hard decision to pick between the two, but ultimately, I only barely went with Claxton because I just think he's a better shot blocker and an overall better interior presence. I honestly believe that early on in the season last year, Nick Claxton should have been considered for the Defensive Player of the Year award. Of course, no one was going to because it wasn't popular, but statistically, Nick Claxton was one of the best interior players in the NBA, but just no one really talked about it. Not to mention, when it comes to scoring inside the paint, I had to slightly give it to Nick Claxton just because he's averaging like 70% from the field and it's a pretty normal thing for him to do. When you look at the most efficient players when it comes to scoring in the inside, I think Nick Claxton is definitely up there. You could argue it's because he's a center, but he also just takes smart shots and doesn't force to be in the offense. Not that Jared Allen does, but I'm mostly talking about other centers in the NBA. At number 66, I have Kyle Kuzma. This might be a hot take, but now that Bradley Beal is no longer on the Wizards, I think Kyle Kuzma is going to be a 25 points per game scorer. Now, does this mean that the Wizards are actually going to be good? Well, no, but I do think that Kyle Kuzma is going to show that he can be a good scorer when needed. I understand they have Jordan Poole now on the Wizards and that might affect the shot selection, but overall, I still think Kuzma is going to get enough touches to average 25 points. At number 65, I have Al Horvath. Al Horvath is definitely an important part of the Boston Celtics, and I feel like even as he's gotten older, he's become more of a productive player. During their 2022 finals run, he was definitely the X factor of that team, and it wasn't really being able to be shown last year how important he was because they played bad, but still, I think Al Horvard is a very important veteran presence, and he is someone that is still hooping at the old age of 327. But at number 64, I'm going to give the edge to his teammate in Robert Williams. I am someone who has been very high in Robert Williams for the past couple years. I think he's a great shot blocker. He's someone that overall, I've just fallen in love with for the Celtics. And if I'm being honest, I would probably have him higher, but the problem is this man cannot stay healthy. I feel like for the past couple years, I would always make videos about the Celtics, and I would always say, well, hypothetically, if Robert Robert Williams was healthy, they'd be a lot better. And then when he is healthy, they are better, but he constantly gets injured. And now with number 62 being gone on the team, I do believe he is now the X factor of this team. But speaking of number 62, we got Marcus Smart. I will say I do feel bad for Marcus Smart that he got traded because that man was the life of the Celtics team. I will say though, he got traded to literally the second team that I think could honestly fit him. Marcus Smart is a great and grind player. He's someone that is a solid shooter, a great defender, and I think is going to be great 
great for the Grizzlies. When I think of Marcus Smart, I think he is what Dylan Brooks thought he was, but Marcus Smart is the real thing. He's not a fake, he backs up his trash talk and constantly gives it his all. Memphis, you got a great player. At number 62, I got Klay Thompson. Klay Thompson used to be one of the best shooting guards in the league, however, he is significantly dropped, but I do believe that's because of his injuries. What used to make Klay Thompson so great is not only that he didn't really need to dribble that many times to create a shot, but he was also one of the best 3 and D players in the game, and he was a very important part of the Warriors. Unfortunately, because of the injuries, he not only became a worse defender, but now he's just more of a catch and shoot guy. Not to mention, there was a very big stretch last year where he was just inconsistent. Like he would have these big scoring games, but it was on terrible shooting and the Warriors just weren't winning. I think Klay Thompson started to figure out his role though, and since then he's became a way better shooter. But if you're a Warriors fan, well don't you worry, because according to Ja, aka NBA Nerd, he said Klay Thompson is gonna show us why he's gonna be good next year. <laughs> No, but seriously, I think Klay Thompson is starting to get older, and unfortunately, I don't think he's going to be on the Warriors for much longer. But at number 61, I got his brand new teammate in Chris Paul. Besides LeBron James, I would say Chris Paul has had some of the best longevity in the NBA. It is unfortunate that his career is coming to an end, but I still do believe he has a couple good seasons left in him, especially with his role with the Warriors. Me personally, I don't think he's going to start. I could definitely see him coming off the bench, which for the Warriors is a pretty good move, actually. Chris Paul did say that him and Steve Steve Kerr are going to talk about his role, so I'm interested to see what he's going to do. Now at number 60, I have someone that I don't think anyone even expected to be on this list, but I have Ben Simmons. I know what a lot of you guys are going to say, Specs, why is he even on this list and why is he number 60? Well, you have to understand that for the past couple years, he has been injured. And in this case, I'm going to play devil's advocate and honestly say that he has been injured. I do believe he's going to be making a comeback this year, so if that is the case, I do expect him to get back to form in some way. At his best, he can be a great defender all around and he's someone that can get you like 15 to 20 points per game especially on a Brooklyn team where he could be easily one of the best players on this team I've seen some videos of him working out and of course I know it's very hard to judge those workout videos because he does this literally every year but I am gonna give Ben Simmons one final chance I do believe this year if he does play he's going to be an effective player hopefully this back injury is no longer affecting him and Ben Simmons can once again be good now of course if we're talking about his ceiling then I'd say he's a top 20 top 25 guy however i don't know if he can hit that however i do believe this is the one take in this video where i'm either gonna nail it or it's going to end so poorly now speaking of former top picks at number 59 i have tingus pingus or i mean uh chris Stapps porzingis chris Stapps has really never been on a contending team however he just got traded to the celtics so i'm interested to see how that goes i think he's gonna pair well with jason tatum and jalen brown as long as jalen brown stays now last year he did average like 23 and 8 on pretty good shooting stats but i do think his production Production is going to go down just a little bit because of who he's playing with. But in my opinion, this man Tingus Pingus does not need to average like 23 to 25 points per game. He just needs to play his role and the Celtics are going to look like a really good team next year. At number 58, I have Michael Porter Jr. The thing is, we know when Michael Porter Jr. is healthy, he's the guy that can get you around 17 to 20 points per game on great shooting stats. I'm talking about a 50% shooter from the field and about a 42% shooter from the three. Not to mention, he is a solid defender. Defender, and in my opinion, if you were to ask me, I do believe that he was the X factor on this Denver Nuggets team that won a championship. Michael Porter Jr. is easily one of the most versatile scorers in the game, and I do believe as time goes on, his rank on this list could easily go up. The unfortunate reality is this man constantly gets injured, so it's very wishy-washy on if he's going to play or not. But if he is playing, then I do think Michael Porter Jr. is someone that the Nuggets are going to want moving forward, especially if they want to repeat as champions. At number 57, give me the former rookie of the year winner Scotty Barnes. The thing is, a lot of people try to push a narrative that Scotty Barnes had this off year when in reality, his stats weren't really that different. You could argue his impact like, oh, he just didn't look the same or oh, the Raptors were a worse team, but I don't know if that is necessarily Scotty Barnes' fault. I do believe that he is going to start to develop into a better player as time goes on and not to mention there are rumors he could run the point guard position. Scotty Barnes is starting to develop as a playmaker and I do believe if he actually ran point guard for the Raptors, it would be a very intense 
interesting experiment to see. With Fred Van Vliet leaving, I do have a prediction that Scotty Barnes is going to become a 20 points per game scorer and a consistent one at that. At number 46, we got Jordan Poole. I do feel bad for Jordan Poole getting traded to the Wizards. This man just does not look happy. The thing is, I'm reluctant to put him a little bit higher because Jordan Poole sometimes can do some boneheaded things. He's a great scorer and he has a lot of potential, but this man has done some of the dumbest things in game I've ever seen. The good news for him is he's playing on the Wizards where I do believe he is easily the best player on that team, which I don't know how much of an accomplishment that is because the team's Roomba is actually the second best player. Unfortunately, he did not make the list. But all jokes aside, Jordan Poole is someone that I think is going to go from a 20 points per game score to about 25 points per game. Unfortunately for the Wizards themselves, I don't think this is actually going to be a team that does anything. So yeah, it'll be 25 points on a team that's going in the lottery. The Wizards are going to be bad for the next couple years, bare minimum. So I do think that Jordan Poole can just develop his game and soon he'll maybe be a top 25 player, but he has things that he needs to get better at. At number 55, we have Cade Cunningham. There's not a whole lot of things I can say about him. I think he has potential, but he got injured last year. So that's why he's not higher on this list. With Detroit becoming a better team and having a brand new coach in Monty Williams, I think Cade Cunningham's third year is going to be very telling of this man. I do think he needs to work on his shooting a little bit, which is why I didn't put him a little bit higher. But if he can just work on his shooting and being a better scorer, I think he's going to be just fine. And just like Jordan Poole and Scotty Barnes, he's going to move up on this list. At number 54, I have Aaron Gordon. There's not really a whole lot of things I can say about him besides good things. He played a really good role on the Nuggets, and I do believe him or MPJ was the reason they won the championship. I mean, obviously, we can look at Jokic and Murray and say, oh, those guys were the best players. But the role that Gordon and MPJ played is something that not a whole lot of teams have. I know some people might think, oh, but he's supposed to be higher on this list, and that would be true. But these guys coming up are mostly all-star and all-star caliber players. At number 53, I do have OG on Adobe. He is a trade asset that a lot of people wanted last year. However, Masai Jerry did not want to trade him because he saw the value in him. He's someone that could be a pretty solid scorer, but most importantly, he's a tenacious defender. And again, someone you're going to want on your team. It looks like the Raptors could be trending towards a rebuild. And if that is the case, I do expect OG to get traded. I'm not going to really break down the trade rumors right now because obviously I have more players on the Raptors to talk about on this list. But just know if OG does get traded and if it is to a contender, he's going to be the X factor of said team. At number 52, we have the rookie of the year and Paulo Bencaro. While I could have put Paulo higher on this list, I don't think it was fair to put him above a bunch of guys when he only really had one good year. To be fair, he's only been in the league for one year, but still. Orlando is a team that is on the rise right now, so I'm interested to see how Paulo is going to play into that team, hopefully making the play-in, or at least the playoffs. At number 51, we got Jeremy Grant. Now, if this was a list based on bank robberies, then I'd have to give it to Jeremy Grant. How this man got the contract he got, I honestly couldn't tell you. Regardless, Jeremy Grant is a 20 points per game score who I think could be good for the Blazers but I just don't think they're gonna do much as a team so I'm not that impressed again not much I can really say about him other than get your bag man but with Jeremy Grant out the way ladies and gentlemen we have made it to the top 50 of this list if you guys are watching this right now then think of this as an intermission get your popcorn get your snacks go to the bathroom and make sure you're ready because we got 50 more players and this is gonna get interesting at number 50 I have Brooke Lopez I think Brooke Lopez made the right decision coming back to Milwaukee because he can really help this team out. His offensive game has gotten better over the years, but I'm more focused on what he did on the defensive side. I don't know how many people realize this, but Brook Lopez was very important on the defensive side last year for the Bucks. I mean, he was so good that he was the runner-up of the defensive play of the year last year. And if Jaron Jackson Jr. didn't have the crazy jump that he did, I honestly would have gave it to him or Giannis. At number 49, I have Rudy Gobert. I only really put Rudy Gobert above Brook Lopez just because I do think that Rudy Gobert is a better rim protector. But as far as an offensive game goes, there's a reason why he's not higher on this list. He's not that good on the offensive side. And honestly, I don't know why he's on the Timberwolves, like why they made that trade. I think it's only going to make his career go downhill. At number 48, I got Andrew Wiggins. I do believe if the Warriors are ever going to make it back to the finals, that they're going to need Andrew Wiggins to play the role he did back in 2022. Also, real quick, shout out to Andrew Wiggins for fixing his career as soon as he joined Golden State. I feel like a lot of people gave up on him, but ever since he has joined that team, he's became a way better player and he's found the perfect role. At number 47, I have Evan Mobley. Evan Mobley is a great shot blocker and overall for Cleveland, he's been a great player for the foreseeable future. My issue with him is that he's just not a good shooter, so he can't really space the floor. His inside game is pretty good, but overall, I just think if he had more of an offensive bag, I could put him higher on this list. But for being a very young guy, this isn't a bad spot to be in. At number 46, I have DeJounte Murray. The thing is, on Atlanta,
Atlanta, I don't feel like he's going to reach his full potential. He's very limited to kind of a 3 and D player, and while he's going to score a good amount of points, I think he's going to cap out as a 20 points per game score. Don't get me wrong, all around he's a great player, and I do believe on the defensive side, he's a very important player to have, especially at the guard position. I just don't think that he can really be any higher on this list due to the fact that he's kind of limited to what he can do on this team. At number 45, I have Desmond Bain. Now, I've always been a big fan of Desmond Bain. Also, shout out to him for getting an extension this offseason. It was definitely well deserved. He's a 21 points per game scorer that can do just about everything and is an elite shooter. And I'm not going to lie, this might be a hot take, but I do believe in two to three years he has potential to be an all star. Now, do I think he can be an all star because of the flawed small forward position when it comes to the all star game? Well, yeah. But at the same time, I feel like Desmond Bain's game is only going to level up as time goes on, especially with Dylan Brooks leaving the team. Now, Bain is going to have full range of the small forward position and it's going to take a lot more shots than before. So I'm just saying, you guys should watch out for Desmond Bain this year because I think he's going to be a most improved player of the year candidate. At number 44, I have Tyrese Maxey. Like Desmond Bain, I think Tyrese Maxey has the potential next year to possibly be an all-star. With the possibility of James Harden and Joel Embiid leaving this team, I think Tyrese Maxey is going to take their spot right then and there. Again, pretty similar to Desmond Bain and Tyrese Maxey. He's a 20 points per game scorer that is only improving that is an elite shooter. I think you guys can pick up why I put them so close to each other. The only reason why Maxi is a little bit above him is just because I've seen Maxi in the playoffs multiple times have big time games. If you're a Sixers fan, I wouldn't be worried about James Harden leaving because you got his replacement right here. At number 43, I have Chris Middleton. Usually, I feel like Chris Middleton would be higher, but due to injuries last year where he missed the majority of the season and him looking a little bit wonky, it's hard for me to put him any higher than this. I do still think that Chris Middleton is a great player, and if the Bucks do want to win an NBA championship once again, he's going to be a a very important part of that. But I also do remember that when he was healthy, there were still games he struggled a lot with, and he looks like a completely different player. I'd be lying to you if I didn't think that Chris Middleton is going to have a bounce back year next year, but we just have to wait and see. At number 42, I have Fred Van Vliet. Fred Van Vliet just got a contract with the Houston Rockets, and this man is definitely going to have a great year next year. I am interested to see how his role with Houston is going to be, because now he's playing with a bunch of young guys, and is he going to ball hog, or is he going to try to be a playmaker, a leader? Like, how is he going to play? I'm interested to see this because it's very telling when someone gets a contract and how they act afterwards. While we've heard from numerous people that Fred Van Vliet is a powerful locker room person, which I do believe, what's going to happen when he's with a bunch of young guys where they're trying to prove themselves, but Fred Van Vliet's like, nah, I'm trying to get a bigger contract because this is only a two to three year deal. I could just be chatting at this point, but either Fred Van Vliet is going to jump up higher on this list or he's going to go down as the season progresses. At number 41, I have Drew Holiday. I feel like Drew Holiday could have been higher on this list. He was one of my favorite defensive guards last year, but oh my god, this man was ass on offense, at least in the most important moments. Regardless of the way he played in the playoffs last year, I still do think this is the perfect spot for him. This range of players that we're talking about right now are either all-star or all-star caliber players, and right now, he's currently tilting that line. But at number 40, I got DeMar DeRozan. Not a whole lot of things I could really say at this point. DeMar DeRozan has had a great career, and on Chicago, he's been a solid player. However, it is unfortunate that he's getting older, and the older he gets, he's probably going to drop more down this list. Honestly, Chicago wasn't even that good of a team last year, so it was very hard for me to pay attention to DeMar DeRozan as much as I have in recent years. I do think the year before is probably the best we're going to see DeMar DeRozan, and everything else after that is not going to be as good as it was before. But I do think if Chicago wants to be a great team once again, that he is going to have to step it up a little bit this year. Now, at number 39, I got Julius Randle. Julius Randle actually played pretty well last year. He was a 25 and 10 guy that shot pretty decently and was okay from the field. He was impressive for the Knicks, and overall, I do think Randall is starting to be a lot better as a player. I think we can all look at last year and say that another player on this list was the reason why Julius Randall did elevate his game, which is good. With Julius in his prime right now, I do believe that over the next couple seasons, he could transcend into a 27 points per game score, an efficient one at that. At number 38, I got Zach Levine. I do believe that Zach Levine is slightly higher than these last two players, just based off consistency. Levine, for the past five years, has consistently been around a 25 points per game score, an efficient one at that. You could have the argument on, oh, Zach Levine is more important to the Bulls, or oh, DeMar DeRozan is more important to the Bulls. Now, in my personal opinion, I do think Zach Levine is slightly better, again, just because of the consistency. Now, at number 37, and this might be a little hypocritical, I have Mikael Bridges. Mikael Bridges had a very interesting run with the Phoenix Suns. However, when he got traded to Brooklyn, this man was a completely different player. This guy went from a consistent 17 points per game score to an instant 26 points per game score on great efficiency and still a great
great defender. I know I don't like going on potential usually, and I see a guy like Zach Levine like, oh, he's done this for five straight years. But I do think I can make an exception for Mikel because we saw the instant transition of someone that became a number one scorer. And now he's going to be a lot more comfortable with his team. He's going to have more reps. He's going to have more time overall. And now we're going to get to see the full potential of Mikel Bridges. I said this about Desmond Bain earlier, but don't be surprised if this man becomes an all-star because the small forward position is flawed. And no, I'm not saying that to be disingenuous. I genuinely believe he's going to be a great player. Hence why he is so high on my list compared to maybe where other people would put him. At number 36, I have DeMontis Sabonis. It's very obvious that Sabonis was one of the reasons why Sacramento was so dominant this year. Not to mention he is a guy that can average you a triple double while shooting pretty efficiently. I guess my only beef with him is that on the defensive side, he's not always the best and he can be pretty lackluster at times. If Sabonis can improve on the defensive side, I would expect him to jump more higher on this list, but that's really not the case. Sure, the regular season is nice, but I need to see more in the playoffs. At number 35, I have brand new Phoenix Sun, Bradley Beal. Bradley Beal is going to have a very interesting year this year. He's not going to be the best scorer on this team. Quite frankly, he's going to be number three. I think he's going to have some pretty good averages, maybe 20 points per game. He's going to shoot pretty efficiently, but I'm interested to see what he can do in the playoffs. With Cameron Payne being traded while making this video, it feels like Bradley Beal is going to run the point guard position, and that's not coming from me. That's coming from a lot of sources. And I actually just got confirmation on this. The Athletics said he's going to be entering training camp as the projected point guard. If he is running the point guard position, then I am interested to see how he can be as a playmaker. In Washington, he was never really the point guard from my understanding. I will say though, I expect Beal to be a really good point guard just for the fact that he has so many weapons at his arsenal. I would put him higher on the list, but unfortunately he's dealt with some injuries in the past. Also, Washington was just never really a good team. If this season he's a reliable playmaker and someone that can score at will, then I might put him in the top 30. However, I don't think being at number 35 is such a bad spot for him. At number 34, I got the Twitch streamer himself, Carl Anthony Towns. Now last year, he technically had a drop off, but he only played like 29 games and obviously he was injured for most of the year. I do think this year, even if he's healthy, I think he's still going to regress just a little bit because of Rudy Gobert. I am interested to see how Kat is going to do with a full season with Rudy Gobert on the offensive side and even the defensive side. It would also be very hard for me to put this man any lower than he is right now because he is easily the best shooting center in the NBA. I don't know about all time. I would probably have to go back and look at it, but there is a possibility he's the greatest shooting center of all time. At number 33, I got Darius Garland. I am a big fan of Darius Garland and the Cleveland Cavaliers, and I am interested to see as time goes on how he's going to develop. Right now, he's around a 22 points per game scorer who is a great playmaker, someone who's solid on the defensive side, and someone who can shoot pretty well. And I'm not going to lie, I'm honestly looking at Darius Garland next year with the possibility of him being an all-star player. There's not a whole lot I can really say about Darius Garland necessarily. I have really only positive things to say. I will say though, in last year's playoffs, I believe he played way better than Donovan Mitchell, which is just something to think about. Maybe Donovan Mitchell is considered the better player, but Darius Garland is someone that I think is going to show up when he needs to. Don't worry, I'm going to talk about Donovan Mitchell's disappointing playoffs later on in this video. At number 32, I got Jalen Brunson. I feel like the battle of Jalen Brunson and Darius Garland is very close, but ultimately, I'm going to give Brunson the slight edge just because of last year and how well he played when in New York. He was a great player in Dallas, don't get me wrong. However, he wasn't going to ever be a ball dominant player because he was playing with Luka. While I think Dallas definitely did help his development, I just felt like he was being kind of held back. And what we saw last year was proof of that. Brunson is going to be coming into his second season with a team that damn near made the Eastern Conference Finals. Not only is Brunson going places, but this team as a whole is going places. At number 31, I have the fake all-star himself, Tyrese Halliburton. Last year, I was a huge fan of Tyrese Halliburton, and I genuinely believe that he was going to be the Pacers franchise player. Which, I mean, looking back at it now, that really shouldn't have been that crazy of a take. Halliburton is a 20 and 10 guy who can shoot about 40% from three with a pretty interesting form. Indiana has been a subpar team these past couple years though, so I do think Tyrese Halliburton is going to be the reason they go farther, but they need to do a little bit more. And with him being locked in for the next five years, I do predict that Indiana is going to be a playoff team during that time, and hopefully they could be contenders. Now we are in the top 30, and at number 30, I have the defensive player of the year, Jaron Jackson Jr. How much do I need to say? A 18 and 7 guy who is a great shot blocker and someone who is great inside the paint when it comes to scoring. Memphis had a terrible ending last year, so I'm interested to see how they do this upcoming year, and I think Jackson's defense is going to be very important. At number 29, I got Swipe of Fox himself, De'Aaron Fox. While DeMontis Sabonis, you could argue, was the difference maker of the Kings making the playoffs and being a contender, I'd argue 
De'Aaron Fox is the main reason. Fox is fresh out being an all-star last year, so I'm interested to see what happens this year as the Kings are now going to be looked at as more of a serious team. I'm not going to lie, I love Fox's game and I'm excited for next season to see what he can do on the Kings. At number 28, I got Bam Adebayo. The thing about Bam Adebayo is last season in the playoffs, he annoyed me a couple times. He was just a complete idiot. I guess that's the best way to put it. I still do believe he is one of the best centers in the NBA and also one of the best shot blockers in the NBA, but I'm not going to lie. There were many moments last year where I was very confused on why Bam Adebayo was playing the way he did. Now, at number 27, I have Kyrie Irving. As I was doing research for this video and I was looking on some lists, I started to notice a trend where we're starting to underrate Kyrie Irving. I get it. He's done dumb shit in the past, hence why he's 27 on my list and he hasn't played a whole lot, but God damn, we're forgetting like Kyrie Irving is not one of the best point guards in the league. We're forgetting like Kyrie Irving isn't arguably the most skilled player in NBA history. I mean, this man casually for the past five straight seasons has averaged about 27 points per game. Now, yes, in two of those seasons that he only played 20 games and one of those seasons he only played 30 games, yes. However, when Kyrie Irving is at his peak and he's playing games, we all know how good he is. Unfortunately, yeah, there's been a lot of reasons why he hasn't played in the past couple years, but I do think with Dallas now, he's going to actually start playing pretty consistently. Yeah, I just thought it was weird that a lot of people kind of forgot that Kyrie Irving isn't floating in that top 25 range. Now at number 26, I got Laurie Markkinen. I know it is very hard for me to put Laurie Markkinen this high just because he had one good season last year, but with Utah, I feel like now this man's unlocked potential is here. He's the number one option on this team and no one is going to take that away from him. Utah was a really good team to start off the year, but then I guess someone in management said, yo, chill the fuck out. Like, is it not weird to anyone that Utah was like one of the best teams in the league for the first like 10 to 15 games and all of a sudden they just stopped on purpose like you cannot convince me someone in the front office didn't say yo chill the fuck out we're still trying to get Wemby next season is going to be very telling was this a fluke last season or is Larry Markkinen actually someone that should consistently be an all-star also quick side note if Keontae George has the potential it seems like he has expect Utah to fuck some shit up in the west at number 25 I got Brandon Ingram do you guys remember when the Pelicans were one of the best teams in the NBA last year well I do and if it wasn't for Zion Williamson getting injured for the 30th time and fucking with a star, then honestly, I think the Pelicans would have been contenders last year, preferably in the top three range. Okay, maybe not that crazy, but they still have potential and Brandon Ingram is one of the reasons why. Brandon Ingram is a consistent 25, 5 and 5 guy who can shoot pretty well from the field on the three point line. He is an all star caliber player and is someone that can score at will. How much more do I need to say? He's a top 25 player. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. At number 24, I got Paul George, aka someone who just started his own podcast. And speaking of podcasts, I have my own podcast, The Starting Five Show. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure y'all check that out. We just did an episode without Vini Linguini. We drop episodes every single Friday. Make sure y'all check it out. But getting back on track, Paul George is still a great player at the end of the day. While he has definitely dropped in the ranks due to injuries and overall just not being the best in the playoffs, I do believe if he was healthy last year and him and Kawhi played together that there is like a 50 to 60% chance the Clippers beat the Suns in seven. We saw how close it was when the Clippers took the Suns to six games. Imagine what would have happened if they had playoff P. And no, I'm not talking about the version in 2020 when it hit the side of the fucking backboard. I'm talking about 2021 playoff P, the one that did pretty well versus the Suns and honestly scared me. I do expect Paul George to have a pretty good season this year, but a lot is going to need to happen if the Clippers want to be a good team. More on that later. Oh, and speaking of the Clippers, Alvini Linguini, we just did a... Okay, let me chill. At number 23, and this might piss some people off, I have Jalen Brown. It's not that Jalen Brown is a bad player. It's the fact that this man cannot dribble with his left hand and was terrible in the playoffs last year. Now, I will say Jalen Brown did have a pretty good year last year. In fact, I'd argue statistically he had his best season ever. In fact, it was so good. This man is closing in on a $300 million extension. Look, I think Jalen Brown is good, but this man is not worth $300 million. I will say though, if Jalen Brown didn't play as bad in the playoffs, he'd probably be a little bit higher on this list, but I do think 23 is a solid place. At number 22, I got Trey Young. I know a lot of people try to say that Trey Young is overrated, but do not get it twisted. This man is still a consistent 26 and 10 guy who apparently now is starting to be a good defender. We saw flashes of Trey Young being a solid perimeter defender last year, which I don't know how consistent that's going to be, but if it is, then well, I'd be kind of scared. The only part I don't like about Trey Young's game is while he does shoot deep, he's not exactly the most consistent three point shooter. If he could just shoot a little bit more consistent, then honestly, I think Trey Young would be higher on this list, and I think more people would take him 
serious. Also, let's not forget, this man is only 24. He still has a lot of developing left to do, and when he does, I think he's going to be a great player, maybe even in the top 10. At number 21, I got Jamal Murray, and look, I know Jamal Murray had a great playoff run last year, and when Jamal Murray plays in the playoffs overall, he's a great player. But do not let people try to tell you he's now a top 10 player or a top 15 player. While Jamal Murray is great, do not let recency bias play a factor. The good thing about Murray is now we've seen him play a healthy season with the Nuggets. And I do expect him to possibly make the jump to top 15 in a couple years, but it's going to take a little bit more. And I know some Nuggets fans might be pissed, but y'all do not let recency bias play a factor. He's still at 20 points per game score. I will say though, it would be completely disingenuous if I didn't take his playoff performances into consideration, which I definitely did. At number 20, I have James Harden. While James Harden is no longer the 35 points per game scorer guy who was an MVP candidate, let's not act like this man isn't one of the best playmakers in the league. Over the past couple years, James Harden has kind of transcended into more of a playmaking guy. While he does average 21 points per game, which would have been bad for him in his MVP years, this is pretty good now. And overall, I do believe this is the type of player you can win a championship with, not MVP Harden. At number 19, I got Pascal Siakam. Pascal Siakam is one of the most underrated players in the game, and I'm still not going to understand why. It could be the fact that nobody cares about the Toronto Raptors, but might I digress. There are rumors of Pascal Siakam possibly leaving the Raptors due to a trade. I've heard Atlanta is a possible spot, but I'm going to say this, and I mean this confidently. If Pascal Siakam does not get traded from the Raptors, and he's playing on this team by the start of next season, I believe that Pascal Siakam is going to be a 26 points per game scorer and an easy all-star level player. Okay, I'm an all-star starter, but at this point, y'all probably knew what I meant. I know a lot of people in the media are saying that Siakam is going to get traded, but I'm also seeing a lot of things proving that this man doesn't even want to leave, and it's just the media causing shit trying to force him out. Honestly, I couldn't tell you, but at this point, what I can tell you is that Pascal Siakam is still a great player. At number 18, I have Jimmy Butler, and yes, recency bias is still not playing a factor. You might have saw playoff Jimmy and said, hey, why is he not higher on this list? Like I've seen a lot of people do, but I'm sorry, I'm not going to act like at the end of that playoff run, he did not completely fall apart. Jimmy Butler is still a great player, hence why I do believe number 18 isn't a terrible spot, but a lot of people were trying to tell me that he became a top 10 player instantly because of what he did in the playoffs, even though we saw it was very limited towards the end of the run when it became most important. Jimmy is still a great player, don't get me wrong, but I'm sorry, I just cannot put him above 18, especially with who's going to be on this list. At number 17, I have Kawhi Leonard, and I know a bunch of people probably just left this video or clicking off, calling me a dumbass, whatever. But you have to understand that this man Kawhi Leonard is never healthy. And I know this is going to seem so hypocritical when I go on this list a little bit more. When Kawhi Leonard is healthy, I truly believe this man is damn near a top five player in the league. He's locked for top 10, even top seven. But the problem is he's never healthy and he's consistently missing games. I don't know if bro forgot to do his iOS update. I don't know if his hardware is flawed. I don't know what the hell is going on. Okay, but all jokes aside, this man is consistently injured and it does not help his case. Oh, but Specs, he played 52 games in back-to-back -back seasons. Are we supposed to be fucking proud of that or something? That's not good. I also do want to mention the fact that technically it wasn't back-to-back -back seasons because this man went missing for damn near a year and a half. And then in the season he finally returns, not only did this man load manage like a motherfucker, but in the playoffs he got injured once again. It is very disingenuous if I put this man any more above than I already have. Like I saw some guy putting him number two and some other dumbass putting him at like number four. I love love Kawhi, but come on, be fucking for real. Oh, and this is a perfect transition because at a number 16, we got Zion Williamson. Once again, Zion Williamson can be a great player, but this man is consistently injured and is apparently now with stars. What the fuck happened? Zion is still a 26 and 7 guy who is great inside the paint and can shoot okay from three. However, when he plays, he doesn't play in that many games. Luckily for him, he still does have potential, and I do believe that if he does play a full healthy season this year, then we'll be good. However, it looks like he would be going around the Kawhi Leonard route where he's a great player, but he's consistently missing time. The only difference is that Kawhi is a NBA champion and someone who used to play full seasons. Okay, I'm editing this right now and I'm not gonna lie. 
I think Zion and Kawhi are very interchangeable. You could flip them. It just depends, I guess, on the day. But yeah, everything else on this list, I do stand by. At number 15, I have Damian Lillard. There is a rumor that Damian Lillard could be getting traded to the Miami Heat, which I think is going to definitely help him out. Whether it's now him possibly being on a finals contending team or the fact that he would still be the number one option on that said team. And even if it's still Jimmy Butler's team and he's the number one option, well, Damian Lillard, that's going to be one hell of a second option. There's not a whole lot I can really say, but other than top 15, I think that's a pretty solid place for him. At number 14, I have Anthony Edwards. I do believe that Edwards is slightly better than Dame just on the fact that he's younger, he's quicker, and I think he's better in most things other than three-point shooting. Also, Edwards has had better playoff success than Dame. It hasn't been much, but it's still more success at the end of the day. Now, obviously, I'm talking about recent years. I know Dame has played for a million years, so obviously he's won more games technically, but you know what I'm trying to say. You could interchange these. However, I do think this season, Edwards is going to shock a lot of people and could possibly transcend into a 30 points per game score. At number 13, I'm going to put Donovan Mitchell. Donovan Mitchell is only barely getting the edge because he's been around longer, he's done this more consistently, and he had a career high year last year. But I'm not going to lie, I still cannot forget the absolutely terrible playoff run that he had last year. This man went from a 28 points per game score to an inefficient 23 points per game score. What the hell happened? I do think him and Cleveland are better than this, so hopefully this isn't a reoccurring thing, but you never really know. However, he is consistent in most parts of his game, so that's why I think putting him in the top 13 is not that crazy. At number 12, I have LeBron James, and I know the LeBron stands are ready to get their pitchforks and come to my house, but let me explain. Number one, LeBron James is a great player, do not get me wrong, but I don't think he's top 10 anymore. I think he's getting older, and I do believe that he's becoming slightly worse than he has before, but honestly, is that crazy to say the man is over 40 years old? However, it would be disingenuous if I put him any lower because he's still damn near a 30 points per game score. He's someone who can do just about everything, but I'm not gonna lie, his age is playing a factor. I also do believe this season he's going to regress a little bit, but that's just me. But if LeBron can lead this Lakers team, who had a crazy jump last year from one of the worst teams in the league to a team that made the Western Conference Finals, but if this man can come back and bring the Lakers to a higher seeding and overall be a great team, then honestly, I think it's okay to put him higher on this list. Because yes, I'm saying it right now, I have my doubts about the Lakers. At number 11, I got John Morant. John Morant is someone that I think that can be a top 10 player, but this man is doing stupid shit and now he's missing time. Regardless, I don't think number 11 is necessarily a bad spot to be in, especially given how young he is as a player. He still does have some development to do physically and maturity, but still, as someone that can score 26 points per game and was one of the key reasons why the Grizzlies were high contenders, I think it's fair to say he's still a great player. And with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, we are finally in the top 10 and I don't know if you can tell, but I'm starting to lose my voice. Regardless of that, at number 10, I got Shea Gilchis Alexander. Yes, I do believe that SGA is now a top 10 player in the league. Shea had an insane jump last year, being a around 25 points per game score to averaging 31, 5, and 5 last year, while the Thunder got better as a team. I do think that SGA is only going to get better as time goes on, especially for how young he is. A lot of people have underrated this man for the past couple years, but I do believe that people are going to finally start paying attention to him. Some people in the comment section might think that I'm overrating this man, but honestly, I think this season is going to tell a completely different story. At number 9, I got Anthony Davis. I know I talked about injuries earlier and I talked about Kawhi and Zion, but the thing with Anthony Davis is, yes, he does get injured a lot. However, I think it's kind of funny that one, Anthony Davis is only 30 years old, and number two, he hasn't been as much injured compared to these other guys. Like, Anthony Davis won't miss an entire season because of some weird mysterious injury. He's still playing and he still tries to get on the court at the end of the day. And when Anthony Davis does play, this man is a wrecking ball. 26-13 on pretty great efficiency. If you're a Lakers fan, I think you're going to be looking forward to this next season because y'all have a lot of potential and I think it starts with Anthony Davis. At number 8, I got Kevin Durant. I feel like whenever I see a top 5, top 10 list, whatever, Kevin Durant is consistently in the top 5. However, I don't think that's the case anymore because I feel like he's kind of regressed a little bit as time has gone on. You could blame that to injuries or just the fact that teams have finally found a way to shut him down. But don't get it wrong, he's still a great defensive player. He's still one of the best scorers in the league. And I do think because of this that the Phoenix Suns are going to be a very good team next year. And now he's going to get a full season with this team, but more about that later. Psych, I lied because at number seven, I got Devin Booker. This might be controversial putting Booker slightly above Kevin Durant, but my only justification is that Devin Booker has played a lot better than KD 
Embiid has in the past year. Also, let's face it, this is Booker's team. I know a lot of people said, oh, KD's down the team. This is his team. No, it was Booker's team, and it was always Booker's team. I think last year, we also saw a great elevation in his game. He became one of the best on-ball defenders when it comes to guards, and overall, I'm very impressed with what Booker has done. However, the only reason why I cannot put him top five is because of his closeout games. The unfortunate reality is that this man, Devin Booker, is terrible in closeout games, and it's embarrassing to say the least. If Booker was good in closeout games and overall could win a couple, then yeah, I'd have him higher on this list. However, there have been many instances of Booker just not showing up to the occasion. And trust me, this is coming from a Phoenix Suns fan, one that literally has a Devin Booker jersey and a Kevin Durant jersey in the back. Regardless, I just cannot put him top six or top five with what I've seen in closeout games. Regardless, he's still a great player. But if this man could prove me wrong and in the playoffs, he shows out more than ever, then yes, I think I could put him top five and it wouldn't be that crazy to say. But honestly, I just don't think he's there quite yet. And at number six, I have Luka Doncic. And yes, I know the Suns fans have their pitchforks. They're ready to attack me. But you have to understand that Luka Doncic, and I hate saying this, but Luka Doncic is better than Devin Booker at everything except defense. And yes, I know that is a very big thing to not be better at, but still, we cannot ignore Luka's abilities. If Luka can do what he did this year and once again have a great season, then I'm not going to lie. The Mavericks are going to look great to possibly make the playoffs and be better than what they were last year because what the hell was that end? Also, they're getting a full season with Kyrie Irving as long as some stupid shit doesn't happen. So I'm interested to see how they go about that as far as who's handling the ball, who's running the offense more. But don't get it twisted. I do still think Luka Doncic is the best player on this team. And yes, I think it's fair to call him a top five player. At number five, I have Jason Tatum. I think Tatum had a great year last year. And I think finally this man has transcended into the top five conversations. While yes, I do believe he could have done slightly better in the playoffs. I do think that as time goes on, Tatum is only going to develop better and better and that the Celtics have a real possibility of winning the championship. I'm not going to lie, I am predicting that Tatum is going to average around 32 points per game and is possibly going to be an MVP candidate, but I don't know. I guess we're just going to have to see, but yeah, I think Tatum is the top five player. At number four, I have Joel Embiid. Now, usually I was going to put Joel Embiid higher on this list and not that higher, honestly, three or two, but the thing is, is that Joel Embiid in the playoffs is a fucking joke. Embiid won the MVP last year. He's always a great regular season player, but I was so reluctant to even put him here because this man chokes in the playoffs and history is not going to let you remember that. I think last year we finally got to see that Joel Embiid is a choke artist because there was really no one else to blame. Regardless, he is still someone that can score 30 points per game while being one of the best regular season players in the game. But yeah, there's a reason why I don't think he's the best center in the league and why I think Jokic should have won that MVP. But of course, we're going to talk about more on that later. At number three, I have Stephen Curry. I feel like out of the top players in the NBA, Steph Curry is consistently one of the best. However, with all the talent in the league, I don't think he's one and I don't think he's two. I do think though that there are times when he plays like it, but again, just with all the talent, I just don't think he's there anymore. But I will say if we were having a conversation about the best players in the NBA and you did say Steph Curry was your one, I wouldn't say that's the craziest of things. I wouldn't agree with you, but I could see it. Now, number two and number one, they're very interesting to talk about and I think at times they're interchangeable, but as of right now, this is my opinion. At number two, I have Nikola Jokic. Some people might be saying, oh, but Specs, did you see the playoff run he just had and isn't he the best player in the world? I do think he played like the best player in the world and I think it would be unfair to put him anything less than two because Jokic showed us last season in that championship run that he has the potential to be the best player in the world. And similar to Steph Curry, I think you could say, oh, in my opinion, I believe that Nikola Jokic is the best player in the world and I wouldn't think you're that crazy. I think there are some nights where I think Jokic is the best player in the world and then there's other nights where I think the other player is the best in the world. I will say the only reason why I'm kind of taking number one a little bit above him is just because of the defense. However, I will give Mike Malone credit. He was able to mask Nikola Jokic's defensive weaknesses, which I made a video about. Now at number one, I think it's pretty obvious. Give me Giannis Attentacumpo, in my opinion, still the best player in the NBA and the world. I know Giannis and the Bucks had a terrible end to the playoffs last year, but let's not act like Giannis didn't completely break his ass. Giannis is one of those players that can do damn near everything except shoot. But like he said, God made him amazing. So how is he supposed to give him everything? He needs to be humbled. All jokes aside, I still believe full confidently that Giannis is the best player in the world. I do think that he's going to lead the Bucks next year to 
to winning the finals, but I'm going to talk more about that in a future video. But ladies and gentlemen, that was my top 100 list. This is easily the longest video I've ever made. This took the most time out of a video, and overall, I had a lot of fun. I know not everyone is going to agree with my list, and honestly, that's completely fine. These lists are very subjective. Not everyone is going to agree, but at the end of the day, this was still very fun to make, and I'm not going to lie, I don't know if I'll ever do this again. Like, my voice is completely gone. I'm barely able to form a fucking sentence right now because I've been talking for an hour straight. How the fuck do streamers do this? Regardless, I know you guys aren't going to make a top 100 in the comment section below, but tell me what you guys agreed with, what you didn't, and most importantly, if you guys want to, drop maybe your top 10s or top 25s, then I'll check them out. Now, usually at this point of the video, I would kind of segue into a video on my main channel. However, the video has done so well recently, which by the way, thank you so much. Like the Malika Andrews video did its thing. I uploaded two other videos separately. Those did 20k each. So honestly, I would just ask you guys to check out the recent episode of the podcast, The Starting Five Show, which by the way, if you haven't checked out the podcast as a whole, make sure you do. We upload every single Friday. We upload a bunch of clips and shorts throughout the week. We're starting to get more on our shit. But yeah, check out the most recent episode of The Starting Five. It is on the screen right here. And I'm going to take a nap for three weeks. Bye.